OK, thank you all. Uh, my name is Paul Frazee, and I'm going to be talking about Beaker Blue Alpha. Uh, Blue is a project initiative we started about five months ago on Beaker. Uh, we've been working pretty much quietly on this, and this is the first time I'm talking about it anywhere. So I'm pretty excited to be showing it to you. Um, so to get started, uh, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about the goals. Uh, let me know if this starts popping too much, OK? Uh, I want to talk about the goals of the project here. Um, we want to be decentralizing the web, of course, but that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I want to talk really specifically about what we're trying to accomplish through Beaker. <sighs> the way I would describe it is trying to build out a social computing network. Now, when I talk about a social computing network, what I mean is I want to have a network where the software, the data, and the network itself is created by users, is owned by users, and is open to modification by anybody that participates in this system. We are trying to move control of the system entirely into the user's hands. And the idea is that the developers are the users, are the developers. Rather than having all of the features of these applications be sent from the top down by some company that maintains the network, we want to have users developing them themselves so that they can crack open a piece of source code and say, you know what, I got some ideas here. They put together a patch or a plugin or a module, however the software is being distributed in that particular application, and they can publish it. A completely new feature or change to how this network works. And people in their network can see it and take a look at the code and say, yeah, you know what, this checks out. There are no major vulnerabilities and there's nothing malicious in here. So here's a green check mark saying I've audited this. And then somebody else can try it and say, you know what, I love this feature. I highly recommend it. We should all be using this. And as people talk about the different plugins and modules and features that everybody within the network is building, that is how we begin to distribute changes to the network, where software is effectively moving virally through the network horizontally from the community itself, as opposed to being developed from the company that created the application and always coming from the top down. That is the goal that we're trying to create. So we want to have a network where users develop the software. And that is the pathway that I think we can get most effectively to a decentralized web. Now, to accomplish something like this, we have to have a whole lot of tools, which Beaker currently does not yet possess. We've been in a kind of cool prototype phase of demonstrating how you can have a peer-to-peer -peer hypermedia protocol, what it's like to be able to publish websites from your computer. That's all really great. But there's a lot of things between where we are now and a social computing network. Um, there are problems discovering content. It's a little too difficult to find stuff on the DAT web right now. Um, and it's also a little too difficult to build applications. The application stack has been way too anemic so far. So with the Blue project, what we wanted to try to do is we can't get all the way to that end goal yet, but we wanted to at least get to an MVP of what a social computing network would look like. Can we start to get that power into people's hands? So we started by focusing on the developer experience a little bit. And I'm just going to run through the stuff that we've been working on. Okay, So it's just going to be a couple of features, one after the other. So we started by trying to improve on the developer experience. And so we decided to go ahead and implement a fully featured source editor in the browser. Um, so that you can go through uh, site and application creation from scratch and all the way to the end goal without ever having to leave the browser whatsoever. It's also very nice for viewing the source of an application. You could just pop into the editor and take a look through everything. So we're looking at the Beaker browser source code over there on the left. Uh, next, we really felt like it was important to improve on data management. If having access to the code is the most important thing that we're doing with Beaker, then probably the second most important would be giving good control over your data. And so we decided to expand upon the library and take some cues from things like Windows Explorer so that you have a really fully featured files manager for seeing all of the information that you currently work with. So it's your dats, your, your, your files, and also your bookmarks are all getting put into a much more powerful manager. And it's, it still has some work to be done, but that's uh, the, the goal for the library. Uh, we decided to go ahead and attack identity and the way that we're approaching this is that everybody has a personal website. So when you first open up the browser, it's just going to automatically create this website for you. It's a DAT website. And that represents you on the network. Um, not only does this act as a sort of a web presence, so somebody can come to your website and see you know, what HTML you've put there and things like that, but it also becomes the basis for running applications. 
because applications can read and write files on this personal website. And that becomes the basis for building out a whole variety of social applications. Um, let's see. All right, and so getting into the application stack. We have this identity system and we have the file system. Well, we figured it would make a lot of sense to just go ahead and integrate a social networking mechanism on top of identity, where in a way that kind of is similar to RSS, you choose other people that you want to follow, their personal websites, and then you will sync down the information that they create. And then if you're bi-directionally following somebody, so if they follow you, you follow them, you're now in communication with that person. And this becomes a pretty effective backbone for a variety of different applications. So to get that ball rolling, we decided to build a very high-level toolkit called Unwalled Garden. And this is sort of a, a, a set of, of high-level APIs, which actually is uh, wrapping around file schemas. So I'll explain exactly how this works in an architecture section of the talk. But the way that it presents to people is you import this nice little API from, from the Unwalled Garden website, and you can start to follow people and query your feed, add emoji reactions to posts or websites or whatever you want. It's designed to be a very useful toolkit for somebody to sit down and begin to build out applications without having to learn much at all. Not having to understand P2P, not under having to understand the data model internally. This is just what you would like to have if you were to sit down and make a social app. Um, as a sort of uh, bootstrap into the network, we went ahead and made an application called beaker.social that lives entirely in user land and is built on top of this unwalled garden toolkit. And so this is um, sort of our, our you know, Twitter clone. Um, and it's a way to get people bootstrapped into the network so that they can begin to follow other people, get into communication, and then more importantly, start to discover new software so that, that ideally they get off of beaker.social as quickly as possible and into the more interesting variations that other people are making. Uh, finally, um, one aspect that we decided to introduce into the system is decentralized search. This is a kind of a, we'll see how this goes. <laughs> Um, so the Unwalled Garden stack is a set of data semantics. The, the, it's all files internally. And I'll, again, I'll explain this more in, in detail. But basically, it's a set of files that Beaker itself understands. It can look at these JSON files and read the data out of them and put them into an index. And so once the browser starts to understand information, it became kind of obvious, well, you know, we could make that information searchable as well. This is in part motivated because I'm not terribly satisfied with DNS. Um, a lot of people don't like DNS because they're concerned about the political centralization of it, and that's part of it. But actually, my main reason for not liking DNS is that it's a bad UX. Um, I want people to be able to produce websites directly out of the browser, and having to mess around with the DNS registration and adding your key into this really obtuse interface is just not feasible for most people. So with search, what we're trying to do is create an additional mechanism. We're not replacing DNS, but creating a way for people to discover content without having to um, get DNS involved if they don't want to. So we put together a demo. This isn't actually shipping now, but it was something that we created showing how we could build out search. Um, we decided not to stick with the sort of Google style of interface because the content, we're not really sure it's going to be enough content that's indexed to make this actually a good idea. Nobody wants to get into a search engine and always be like, oh, go to Google. So we scratched this particular thing, but we kept all the APIs. So the API that powers this is still part of Unwalled Garden, and anybody could go ahead and revive this project if they wanted to. But what we did stick with was um, putting that search functionality into the query autocomplete of the URL bar. And one of the main mechanisms that we're using to power that index is uh, social bookmarking. So whenever you bookmark something, you'll see this little flag right here where you could say share it publicly. And what that does is it just writes the bookmark to your personal website so that anybody that follows you will sync it down. And then whenever they're typing in an address, they'll see, you can see I've got Andrew's personal wiki in my uh, list of autocomplete. OK, I've been promising to talk about the architecture, so let's do it. The thing that I want to emphasize is that we've been looking at all these sort of high-level behaviors, but it's all just a file system that powers this. It all ends up translating into a write into the file system or a read off of the file system. So the architecture for a long time has been that we have this hypermedia file system in the form of DAP. 
Um, and that allows us to publish websites off of the user's device and, and, and also save information um, from an application. What we introduced with Blue, first of all, is a web crawler, which lives inside of the browser itself. And then we've introduced the Unwalled Garden set of data standards. And so Unwalled Garden is basically a set of data schemas which the crawler is pre-programmed with. It's the kind of files which the crawler can go around and recognize and index. So let's break these down individually. Uh, in a traditional file system, every file has a path, as we all know. Well, in a hypermedia file system, every file has a URL. Uh, the root of a hyperdrive is a domain, and then all of the different folders and files are addressed underneath that domain. Um, of course, the interesting property of a hypermedia file system is that you can link to any file. Now, you can actually make private hyperdrives, but for the moment, let's just go ahead and assume they're all public just to make the conversation easier. Once you have linkable files, publishing becomes just crazily easy, right? You just write a file to your posts directory. If you want to make a, a tweet or something like that, you write a post file, and now anybody that's following you will bring it down, and there you've done it. You've published just by writing the file. Very, very convenient. And then because these things are linkable, if I wanted to comment on that post, I would just write a comment file where I link to the post that I want to comment on. And there I've published my comment. People can bring it down and find, uh, and find my, my, my comment on this post. So you're effectively making a giant global graph of links on top of this file system. It's like a link layer that exists as an overlay on top of the hypermedia file system. And this works for a variety of different kinds of data artifacts, posts, comments, you know, likes, and photo albums. Basically, anything that you publish on social media right now, you can publish using this exact mechanism. Now, what you want to be able to do is write a query across this whole link graph, where you could say, hey, list out all the comments that are on this post file, or tabulate the votes on this link and tell me what the karma, on that, uh, you know, karma score is on that, that submission, things like that. So to accomplish that, you could, of course, manually scan through the hypermedia file system whenever you want to do this, but you're not going to get a very good performance output. So that's why we introduced the web crawler. The crawler is designed to move around through this hypermedia file system and create pre-computed indexes of mainly the links in the system. So the crawler would look at this hyperdrive and say, hey, there's some posts. I know what posts are. And it would pull them into its index, and then you would be able to say, all right, list all the posts for me. Um, and then this gets more interesting whenever you start to merge these indexes together so that if I wanted to create a feed, I would just tell it to give me the posts from three different uh, hyperdrives, and now you've effectively got a feed because they're merged together, right? Another example is comments. This time, it's not just going to look at the existence of the file, it's going to actually look and pull the, the link out of the comment, and that's what makes it possible to uh, create a query where you list all of the comments on a particular link. It's indexing the link information in that case. So this is what the web crawler does. It takes the hypermedia file system, ingests it into an index, and then your queries are powered on top of that. Now these are all secondary indexes. The primary information lives in the hyperdrive. But these indexes are then computed and can be thrown away at any time and recomputed. Um, I mentioned before that there's a social graph mechanism. You follow people. That's currently how the crawler is driven. It decides to index based on who you're following. The last piece of all this is having to do with the data schemas. We can look at this file and say, well, that looks like a social media post. It's pretty intuitive, but there's still a lot of room for interpretation. This could actually be a comment that's just missing its href. So you want to identify what the data is. So you put an attribute on it, like type post. OK, you're closer, but that's still really generic. What we want to have is a schema which is globally unique. Um, and so that's what the Unwalled Garden website is. It's a collection of data schemas which are published at URLs. And we use those URLs to identify data schemas. Um, currently, it is a, a set, it's actually more different kinds of primitives than this. But the API basically wraps around the file system and interacts with the crawler to make it a very high level experience. Um, but again, this all boils down to actually just a set of files that are just JSON. So let's do a demo. OK, so this is the current build of Bloom. Got a new start page on this thing. 
if you look over up at the top right, you can see my avatar up here, and this is my personal website. So if I click on that, you'll see, here we go. I've imported my blog onto this thing, and this is who I am. This is my personal website address. You can share that with anybody, and they'll be able to follow me. Uh, let's see, why don't I jump real quick into the site edit, uh, yeah, the source editor, just to show that you can pop into the source code of these things at any time and start to look around, right? All the, all that makes a lot of sense, right? Let's see, let's see, why don't I jump straight into beaker.social. So here is our little social application. And like I said before, we're using people's personal identity dats, um, their personal websites, uh, to build all this content. So you can see I got a post right here, and here's um, Matthias po uh, making a post earlier. But this data is just files on our personal websites. So if I <coughs> jump over to my profile, this is just another view of this website. This and this are the same thing. It's just that in the case of the beaker.social profile, there's an application that's adding a, a level of interpretation to it. But it's all reading from the same data source. And if I could jump into the URL and strip out this prefix of the beaker.social address, we're right back to my website, right? So it's the exact same data source in both cases. It's just that my data source happens to ship with a UI. And that's this blog. But you can interpret it through other applications. Likewise, the posts are just files. So if I click on this link right here, I jump straight into the editor. This is the source file for that post. And it's actually a little bit convenient, because if I want to edit that thing, I haven't yet gotten to the point where I've got an editing UI in this, but I can just jump into my site editor and save it. Give it a half second to index. And there we go. Edited the post, right? So I've got all of my data inside of this data directory here. I've got my list of follows right here, just following two folks. All my posts, my public bookmarks are up here. All just files. OK, so for my last little bit, I thought it would be fun to uh, demonstrate what it's like to build an application and also what it's like to use the Unwalled Garden APIs. So I made myself a little timer app. And I'm going to try to build out a competitor to beaker.social in less than two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> With jet lag, right? With jet lag. With jet lag. Right. Here, Mark. With, yeah. You better, yeah. <laughs> we may, maybe we'll just, don't worry about it. OK. On your mark. Yeah. Get set. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> it's going to be a few typos. It's no big deal. I'm going to use web components because I can, and they're great. I'm also going to use ES modules, again, because I can, and they are great. All right. Make my index.js. I'm going to import the post API from Unwalled Garden. When you're doing web components, you extend from the HTML element. Oh. <laughs> Got to jump into a load function because it's async. You can't do async in a constructor. This dot post equals await post dot query. I'll reverse it so that it comes most recent first. This dot enter HTML equals this. You just memorized this, right? <laughs> totally off the top of my head. <laughs> and of course, I got to show who it came from. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, now I register custom elements dot define my app and view the site, give it permission, and done. Uh, uh. Oh, it's beautiful. Uh, exact same data set. It's just running that query against the locally computed index. OK. <laughs> I haven't licensed it yet, so. So um, just before to fi I finish up, I just wanted to make a few comments about some of the decisions I made. Um, there's a little bit of an interesting interchange between what's in, built into the browser right now and what's in user land. And um, I kind of committed a mortal sin on this one, I think, because Unwalled Garden builds in a whole lot of high-level semantics into the built-in web crawler. I was really hesitant to do this for a while because I'm not entirely sure that I think the browser ought to have opinions about how applications are built. And I think some people will agree with me on that. So. I built myself an escape hatch on this. You import the APIs from Unwalled Gar for, for Unwalled Garden from this website. Actually, what happens if you open up that index.js, it's actually just a cheat. It's a wrapper around this navigator function, which is importing directly from Beaker itself. But this is my escape hatch, because if I can eventually get the entire set of data schemas into user land, as opposed to being built into the browser, we now have a really clean pathway for getting it out, right? So that's our sort of like future proofing of that. And then eventually someday, hopefully, Unwall Garden will live totally in user land. The other thing is, I promise, I promise, I promise, there are some people in DAT that really want this. I promise we will get a hypercore API at some point very soon. <laughs> so if you want to try this out, it, there's, you're going to find buttons that just like don't work randomly in things. Um, but you can go to beaker.blue, and it's just actually a redirect to a Google Drive with the, the, the builds. So uh, feel free to, to grab it there. It's not HTTPS. It has to be HTTP so that the redirect works correctly. Uh, and that's it. So thank you all very much. With a lot of the URLs uh, that you have, uh, especially when, when DNS is involved, uh, do you still have to do a whole bunch of lookups when you do the application? Or can you get move into a mode where you pull the hatchling graph and you no longer have to do DNS lookups? So you know. Um, I'm not really sure how far away we can get from DNS. It would be pretty amazing if like, it happened um, as the exception instead of the rule. And uh, one of the things that will end up having a really interesting effect on how lookups happen is the uh, mechanism that Matthias will talk about. So sorry, Matthias, I'm going to blow up your spot. Um, but uh, it's uh, DAT mounts. Mounts are effectively like symlinks. lets you mount a, a DAT as like a subfolder to another DAT. And once you're doing that, you start to be able to compose these gigantic file system hierarchies that are built from multiple different sources. Um, and so a really interesting example of this would be that anytime I follow somebody, I might mount them as a folder. And then if I want to crawl through the network, I could just recursively work down this tree of mounts and like never touch the, not even touch the, uh, the DHT for lookups. It's all just kind of like multiplexed together in one giant thing. So that might have the effect you're talking about. Yeah. So how hard would it be to implement all of these things in user land with IndexedDB at the end? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the question was, um, how hard would it be to re-implement all of, like, on one card, um, entirely in user land um, using, like, IndexedDB? Not impossible. Um, one of the reasons that I wanted to move it into the browser was that I want those, the um, there's a number of reasons. One of them was that I want the indexes to be shared between applications and computed in the background immediately whenever the browser starts. When you have it inside of an application right now, the application has to sync all the new data and then compute all the indexes at the startup point of the application, which is a really bad time for it. It's much better if you're able to have shared indexes across all applications so that they only have to be computed once and then um, have them being handled constantly in the background the minute you start the browser. So that's one of the downsides. Um, but otherwise, it's not, it's certainly technically possible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the back. Um, so this is like the, the demo kind of pitched as a kind of public, uh, kind of everything in the open approach. What are your thoughts about kind of dealing with some like private group or a private application? Um, and how, what does that look like to you? Yeah, so the question was um, everything we looked at there is uh, 
public data, how do we begin to approach private data? Uh, I haven't, I don't know yet for sure. I can speculate about some of the things we can do, uh, but I don't yet know what, what we're going to sell on. A uh, couple of obvious things we can do is um, it, at, use at rest encryption is a, one thing we can begin to do. Um, of course, the trick with that rest encryption is if you're publishing that information publicly and the keys ever get leaked, you've completely lost your security guarantee, so that's not great. Uh, another option is we're working on the um, HyperSwarm, uh, the, the sort of the connection messaging layer between uh, devices, which exists totally off of DAP. Um, and the idea with that will be that someday we can have um, authenticated direct from one computer to another connections um, using keys, again, that you publish on your, on your personal website. Um, and that would be a nice sort of off-channel mechanism for sending uh, ephemeral private information. The last mechanism we can use is DATs, which are you know, new hyperdrives that are designed to be private by default and not shared on the public network. And it, it basically acts as, a, as like a private folder, which you can then choose who to share with. And so some combination of those three mechanisms should add up to a stack that has privacy mechanisms. Uh, yeah. Can I have version control on the apps and all those files and the files? So you're asking, can we have version control on the applications like Git, for instance? Yeah, Git. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, DAT has its own sort of um, version <coughs> control in it, which is sort of like the Dropbox style. And every, every time you make an update, it's a new increment in the revision counter. And you can wind back in history and forward, which is a, a nice tool, but not nearly as powerful as a legitimate source version control. So if you're looking to have something like Git, there is a mechanism inside of Beaver where um, inside of the editor, you can configure a local folder to put the files in so that you can basically escape from the Beaver um, ecosystem and begin to um, use like an external editor and external tools. And that's where you can start to introduce Git. Okay. Uh, yeah, right there. Yeah, no, two more questions. Uh, one is, is it uh, in that Beaker Blue um, state of things uh, possible for an app to add custom indexes that are not built into the browser? Okay. And the second one would be if that indexing part is uh, designed to be usable outside of Beaker, for example, to set up a HTTP uh, Website that would pull in data from the dot in the same way as Zeeker does, and maybe then then add some more dynamic things to publish to the old web. Yeah. So the first question was, uh, is it possible to program custom schemas into the indexer inside of Beaker? And the second question was, is it possible to get the indexing stack outside of Beaker so that you could have web services on the traditional web? They can do the same uh, things. Uh, so the answer to the first question is no, not yet. Um, but that's where it obviously has to go at some point. Uh, what we're going to do at first is just take advantage of um, the convenience we get by having them bound together and try to expand on the unwalled garden data set as much as possible, see how many, many use cases we can solve that way. Um, simultaneously, we'll be gathering requirements on what it'll mean to make the uh, index or um, user programmable, and then hopefully move to that and what makes we. Uh, now, the question about Using the indexing tools outside of Beaker, uh, that has been something that's kind of on my mind. It occurred to me like two weeks ago, like, you know, that would be a really nice thing to have. So I don't know, we'll, when we're sure what we're going to do, we'll, we'll know. But I think that's a good idea. Yeah, don't be. Um, I'm curious, how does the crawler keep track of what it's crawled and not, hasn't, and hasn't crawled yet? So the. Uh, Got some fun interfaces. And is there like a well-defined order that it crawls in that? Is there a well-defined order? There is not a well-defined order. So um, this is showing the current state of my crawler, and uh, it assembles a list of candidates based on your uh, personal social graph and what's in your library, um, and then will, I remember correctly, it may have an order that's based on uh, that prioritizes it based on like. Eventually, what we want to do is have it start to go hops out on the graph to do um, indexes for um, posts that wouldn't show up in your feed, but yeah, this is a familiar idea, right? It'll move. <laughs> this, this is like SSB. Um, 
but it'll show like notifications if somebody adds you that you're not directly following. Yeah. So like it'll prioritize those more uh, further down the list. But if I remember correctly, it's randomized within that weighting. Mm -hmm. So that's the um, that's kind of the sitch there. Here's the here's the crawler's internal log going. On. I've got a color coded here. So let's see what it's doing. Uh, you and the new. Um, maybe I missed it, I don't know. Um, how to manage this if I have different devices and I want to use the same user for the Yeah, we don't have a solution to that yet. Um, so, the, I'm sorry, the question was uh, how do you deal with multiple different devices? Um, currently, we're still working on getting um, multi uh, device support in the DAT protocol itself. So, that's the first step. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, we'll have to answer how to get things nice and synced up. But, yeah, we don't, we don't have an answer yet. Yeah. I'm curious about the part you were talking about where um, you can visit visit some site and then share it publicly such that it ends up in the autocomplete of the browser. Uh -huh. Can you explain a little bit more about how that works and kind of whether it's just something that you can get back to quickly in autocomplete or if that's like a global autocomplete that's happening for everyone? Yeah, so the question was more or less how is the autocomplete getting populated? Yeah. Um, so currently it is populated by two different data sources. That is um, the list of people you were following and the list of bookmarks which have been published by people on your network. Uh, it could be expanded at, uh, more so, but let me just real quick jump to the bookmarks interface. So here are my personal bookmarks and then here are bookmarks that are shared within my network. So here's a bookmark that uh, Matthias made for Beaker.social, here's a bookmark that Andrew made for his wiki. This is the stuff that shows up in my autocomplete, in addition to like my personal browsing history. But like browsing history is not automatically getting added to like everybody's. Yeah, that'd be crazy. Uh, does that answer your question? Cool. There it is. Okay, anybody else? Cool, perfect. Thank you all very much.